What if I told you with one four pair cable, you can connect your device to the network and provide power for it without an electrical receptacle? That's the subject of today's show. Don't hang up that phone. We found what you're looking for. Welcome to the Let's Talk Cabling Podcast with Chuck Bowser, RCDD. Well, seeing how we're pulling Category 6A, the most powerful twisted pair in the world. You gotta ask yourself this one question. Did I pull 295 or 300 feet? Well, do you feel lucky? Do you punk? In this podcast, you'll learn the differences between a 66 and 110 punch tool, the proper way to install a support cable, along with testing and certifying the cable. What exactly does RCDD stand for? Registered Communications Distribution Designer. Just the expert you need to ensure your cable plant performs exactly as designed. The elite professional, knowledgeable, and experienced in leading edge ICT design principles. So join us as we talk about the ever-changing world of telecommunications. From ISP to OSP, from copper to fiber, design to installation. Now, send the new guy to the truck for a bucket of dial tone and the cable stretchers while you listen to an informative program on telecommunications. Welcome to the show where we tackle the tough questions that are submitted by installers, project managers, estimators, IT personnel, and customers. On this show, we connect at the human level so we can connect the world. If you're watching this show on YouTube and you like this content, would you please hit the subscribe button and the bell button to be notified when new content is published? If you're listening to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or some other platform, would you consider leaving us a rating? Both of these steps help us take on the algorithm so we can get more this message out to more people and more people in the ICT industry. Also, don't forget our After Hours series session broadcast live Thursday, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where you could submit your questions to be answered by your favorite RCDD, me, on LinkedIn and YouTube. If you missed that live broadcast, it is recorded later, so you can watch it for your own consumption. Send your questions to questions at letstalkcabling.com. Also, make sure that you check out our webpage where you find all of our recorded podcasts, vlogs, and articles. You can also sign up for our newsletter and also ways to help support this channel. You can support this channel with platforms such as Patreon, becoming a monthly subscriber, Amazon links when you buy stuff, we get a small donation and you don't pay any extra, or you can make single donations through PayPal. This platform is free and will always be free. Those costs that just goes to help set, offset the cost. Since day one, when I got in this industry over 40 years ago, I've heard one thing repeated nearly, every, repeated all the time. Copper is dying. Copper is going away. Now, either from fiber taking over or wireless coming years later. And here we are still installing copper. Now with power over Ethernet and building automation systems, copper appears to be staying around for a long time. Recently, I read an interesting article on power over Ethernet written by a peer at the company I work for, and it spurred me to do this episode. If you're interested in obtaining a copy of that article, of that white paper, be sure to leave me a comment or email me, and I'll make sure that I get you a copy. It's a really great white paper. So first, let's start off with defining what is power over Ethernet. Power over Ethernet is simply just running power and data transmission over the same cable. The amount of power we are sending down the cable with data signals is considered low voltage, usually between 15.4 watts and 90 watts. Not enough to run a microwave, not enough to run a refrigerator, but enough power to to do up small devices, and even some televisions, maybe even some desktop computers. There's many benefits to running power and data over that same cable. First off, it eliminates the need to have an electrician come out to install an electrical receptacle. Now, this is going to help reduce the cost of the overall installation and also help the equipment to be deployed even faster because you don't have scheduling two trades. These are the two primary concerns for most customers. An ancillary benefit is power and equipment will be also in the same room, which also speeds up the deployment. 
It also helps with any moves, ads, and changes, or service work, because all the equipment is in the same room. There is no need to get access to the electrical closet, or try to find the person who has the key for the electrical closet. Now, if you sat any kind of class, you probably heard you have to maintain minimum separation distances between electrical cabling and equipment or any kind of potential sources of EMI. Well, if that's the case, then how can we put power inside the same jacket with our data cable? See, the power over Ethernet uses direct current, not alternating current. There is no frequency to direct current, and thus there is no interference issues or any separation requirements. These benefits come with some major issues, though. First, this really blurs the line between what we as low-voltage technicians and electricians do. While an electrician can do both high and low voltage, low voltage people can only do low voltage installations. A low voltage installer does not have the same training as an electrician. Electricians typically go through 2,000 plus hours of training. And because our voltage is minimal, there's no issues. Also, many areas of the country don't even have low voltage installers pull permits for installations. Now, this This will become an issue when electricians feel that we are taking their work away from them. And then they're going to propose changes to the National Electrical Code Book requiring that even low voltage work to be done by licensed electricians. So let's take a look at the different levels of power over Ethernet. The Telecom Distribution Methods Manual identifies eight classes of power over Ethernet, ranging from Class 0 to Class 8. On this show, we're going to focus primarily on 15.4, 30, 60, 90, and 100 watts power over the Ethernet, power over Ethernet applications. Even though the power source may deliver a voltage such as 60 watts, some of that voltage is used as it goes through the cable and that 60 watts will only be to the power device will only receive 51 watts. In 2002, the 802.3 AF standard defined the requirements for 15.4 watts to support power over Ethernet and 10 gigabit base T and 100 gigabit base T applications. This configuration will use power on two pairs inside that four-pair cable. It's best to use a minimum of a Category 3 cable or higher. In 2009, the 802.3 AT standard was released, which gives us up to 30 watts of power, and the ability to support 1000 base T. It's best to use category 5E or category 6 cable for that kind of a job. Then in 2010, Power Over HD base T was published, POH. This gives us the ability to deliver 100 watts of power and video, audio, and RS-232 for control signals over a category rated cable. This HD base T standard says to use CAT 5E cable, but many manufacturers are going to recommend CAT 6 or even CAT 6A. And some of the manufacturers recommend shielded cabling. Then the 802.3 BT standard came out, and that gave us 60 and 90 watts of power. They do this over four pairs of cable, and generally will need the larger conductor size, which is provided with CAT 6A cabling. CAT 6A cabling can be generally 23 or 22 gauge as opposed to 24 gauge. Well, we've already talked about cabling. Let's discuss the equipment. With power over Ethernet, you're going to need both a power sourcing equipment and a powered device. The power sourcing equipment provides the power that's going to bring the power device to life. If you're designing a power over Ethernet system, be sure that both the power sourcing equipment and the power device match classes. Power sourcing equipments are available in basically three types. You have N-spanned, mid-spanned, and local power sources. Let's talk. Let's take a look at each of those three. The N-span power sourcing equipment is called that because it's located at the end of the cable. They generally are Ethernet switches with some type of power over Ethernet circuits added to them. It should be noted that not every port on power over Ethernet sourcing equipment will have full power. The power device can 
negotiate with the power sourcing equipment the amount of power it's going to actually need to run. This will allow the power sourcing equipment to run more efficiently. And you're going to find that there's a software, a managed software that runs all that stuff that's loaded into the power sourcing equipment. The mid-span power sourcing equipment is located somewhere between the switch, the Ethernet switch, and the power device. You may hear the mid-span power sourcing equipment called a power over Ethernet injector. These are a great option for customers who just install brand new Ethernet switches and they don't want to switch them out right away because the, pe the power over Ethernet, they're regularly non-powered and the Ethernet switch is still within that life cycle. So the customer could still use that piece of equipment they just bought until they have to replace that. So those power injectors work with those perfect for those kinds of situations. They get their return on investment. Now these mid spans can typically be mounted in the telecom room or anywhere between the horizontal cross connect and the power device as long as it's within the standards. Special note here, these devices are not a part of the permanent link. And then finally, the local power source is a power supply that you plug in locally into an electrical receptacle near your power device and then you plug that into the power device. Now let's shift our conversation to those power devices. You're probably wondering what kind of devices can I support with this, all these different levels of power or ethernet that we've been talking about. And the list I'm going to give you is just a, a sample listing. There's far more, but this is just an idea so you can get an example of what to expect. With a 15.4 watt type 1 two pair power ethernet, you can support devices such as thin clients, biometric access control devices, and even some 802.11n wireless access routers. With the 30 watt type 2 power ethernet, it will support card readers, alarm systems, video IP phones, and some pan tilt zoom IP based cameras. The 60 watt four pair power ethernet will support access control, information kiosk, nurse call, point of sales, laptops, and pan tilt zoom cameras with heaters. The 90 watt four pair power ethernet will support TVs, desktops, video conferencing, and even high powered wireless access points. Finally, the 100 watt power over HD base T, known as POH, power over HD base T, supports HD transmitters and receivers. Putting all this energy down a category rated cable is going to raise heat, and heat is the enemy to cable performance. Excessive heat can cause insertion loss, also known as attenuation, and this may require you to use a shorter permanent length than the 90 meters or 295 feet in order for just to get it to work because there's so much attenuation. It could also cause you an increase in the bit error rate and thus bring down the performance of your cable. The NEC addressed this in 2017 in, the, in Article 725 in a table, 725.144, and updated again in 2020 edition. That ampacity, amp ampacity chart will help you to determine the right size bundle based on the amperage on the conductors. One way to not even have to deal with 725.144 is to basically use limited power or LP cabling. Whichever route you go, you're going to want to stay within the cable's operating temperatures, which in 725.144 is 60, 75, or 90 degrees Celsius. The TIA recommends limiting the maximum allowance to 15 degrees Celsius above ambient temperature. So what are some of the things that you want to do as a designer or some of the things you want to do as an installer to help the performance of the cable plant if it's going to have power over Ethernet? First, if possible, use shielded cabling. Shielded cable dissipates heat better than non-shielded cable plant. I know this sounds counterintuitive, and I had issues with this when I first learned this. I had to research it myself. All material has a thermal conductivity. And according to ScienceDirect.com, thermal conductivity is defined as the rate which heat is transferred, the rate that heat is transferred by conduction through a unit cross-section area of a material when the temperature gradient exits perpendicular to that area. So the foil shield in the cable acts as a better thermal conductor than the materials we use to insulate our conductors. So the foil shield draws the heat away from the conductors and because the, the surrounding air 
cools that shielded cable faster, again, because of thermal conductivity of the material. Another tip is, when possible, to use higher rated category cabling. The larger the conductor size, the better. The higher category rated cables typically will have larger conductors. It's easier for the power to travel down that cable if the conductor is bigger. Less heat will be created and makes it a more efficient circuit. When it comes to bundles, loosely bundle them, placing them in a support system is also going to help with thermal conductivity and help cool the cables quicker. Examples would be ladder rack or mesh cable tray. Conduit or solid bottom cable tray will not help dissipate the heat. In fact, it's going to help trap the heat and raise the temperature of the cables. If you want to use bundles, use smaller bundles than you normally would. When you bundle cables, all the cables will strive to reach what's called thermal equilibrium, meaning it'll bring the cables to the same temperature, all the cables to the same temperature. The cooler cables will warm up and the hotter cables will cool off until equilibrium is achieved. Except with cable bundles, you never reach equilibrium. The outer cables will always be cooler from air movement around the bundle of the cables on the outside of the bundles. When you're mixing power over ethernet and non-power over ethernet cables, it helps to ensure that reduce the temperature, make sure that you place the non-power over ethernet cables in the center of the bundle, thus leaving the power over ethernet cables on the outside perimeter of the bundles, exposed to that air movement to help cool those cables off. Next, try to avoid squeezing or necking down the cables where it goes through penetrations or fire stops wherever possible. Now always install the code, install the cable per code and per your AHJ, but avoid this will help keep the temperatures to stay cooler and perform better. Finally, choose a connector that has a metal housing instead of one with a plastic body. There's one manufacturer that claims that their metallic connector housing dissipates heat 53% more efficiently than a plastic bodied connector. One last issue that you're going to run into is arcing when you plug the patch cord into the, the, the port and disconnecting it. When it gets close, it's going to arc. This is common, really especially common, on higher rated power over Ethernet systems. Over time, this can cause pitting on the contacts. And because of pitting, it means there's less material for your pins to make contact with. This is going to affect the performance of your cable as well as your power over Ethernet performance. Choose a connector that mitigates pitting to ensure long-term performance. This is going to save you not only on repairs, it's going to save you on reduced downtime and might even extend the life of the connector. Well, that's it for this episode, and I certainly hope that you enjoyed this content. If you want to hear more shows on Power Over Ethernet, make sure you leave a comment on this video on YouTube or email me with specific questions. I'm thinking I might even bring on a subject matter expert to help talk to us more about power over Ethernet. So until next time, be safe. That's it for this episode of today's podcast. We hope you were able to learn something. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Also, leave a rating so we can help even more people learn about telecommunications. Until next time, be safe.